The truth is, I don't even like running. I mean, y'all know that anyway, but I love the feeling of pushing myself and giving my training a real purpose. That's why I like to do things like Spartan races. They are the perfect tests of all-around athleticism. They have 5K, 10Ks, even halves and ultras, but with obstacles along the way, even throwing spears. Cardio meets strength and purpose. Try it out. Use code SPARTANDAD, and you can get 25% off any Spartan race. It'd be fun. Let me know you're doing it. I'll go try and do one with you. It's a lot of fun. It's a great time. Use code SPARTANDAD for 25% off a race. Have fun plans for the outdoors? Make the memories last with the best outdoor coolers and drinkware. Celebrating 10 years of cool, Orca was founded in 2012, born from the idea of making a hard-sided cooler that beat out all the rest. Orca coolers are built to be as strong as the adventures you take them on. That's why they have a lifetime warranty while giving you world-class maximum temperature retention. Orca's drinkware offers the same high quality, keeping your drinks icy cold or hot for hours, and they look great while doing it. Their stainless steel vacuum-sealed tumblers and martini cup are perfect companions for your next outdoor adventure. Go to orcacoolers.com backslash bourbon for 15% off your order. That's orcacoolers.com backslash bourbon for 15% off. Orca, make it last. Today's show is also sponsored by our friends at distilleryproducts.com. If you are a store, you're a group, you're a blog, you're a podcast, you're a distillery, whatever it is, you need laser edge glassware at wholesale prices. Reach out to me. I'd be happy to get you in touch with the whole family behind distilleryproducts.com doing amazing things. We use them. You should too at distilleryproducts.com. Hello, everyone. My name is John Edwards. Zeke Baker is on assignment, but together we make the Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for making us a part of your day. We're saying that a lot lately on interviews. Zeke Baker is on assignment, but the guy's busy. We'll take him when we can get him. And today we have a great show. We have American Mash and Grain on. That is Devin Ursho and Chase Langdon. Did I get your name right? Yeah. Did. I was like, Urshow? Urshow? Or it is Urshow. See, I said, did I get your name right? And you're like, yeah, you got it right. I should have asked before we started recording. Devin is the CEO. Chase is the COO of American Mash and Grain. First off, welcome to the show, gentlemen. It is great to have you here on De- You got flustered because of our impressive titles. You know, the CEO and COO of this you know, mega corporation. I did the director's cut that you're not going to hear. I just cut out that i said hey who are you and what do you do and i'm like wait i didn't even say hello to you (laughs) urshow over there just like wanted to pass off that i said his name right who's the guy in the nfl for years they were saying his name wrong and he just never corrected them like all through college they said his name wrong and then finally when he got to the nfl he was like you know you're saying my name wrong tom brady (laughs) no tom brady is a god all i'm gonna say (laughs) Where do you all live uh, that you're you're hating on Tom Brady? Let's get that out of the way. We grew up in Jersey. Uh, grew up in Jersey. I uh, I've been a lifelong New York Giants fan, so I have nothing against Tom Brady personally. I was gonna say you are the one person that I mean, or all Giants fans. It's the one team like they don't hate Brady at all. Why would I? I'm a Saints fan. I live down here in New Orleans, you know, and we're uh, what. We beat him five out of the list, last six matchups against him, something like that. But he beat us the one in the playoffs, the one that mattered. And, uh, <laughs> you guys know where I'm originally from, right? Well, I'm going to guess, guess Massachusetts. I am originally from Massachusetts. And I moved to Nashville. To, I, I lived in Kentucky, graduated from Kentucky. I got hurt playing football and then moved down to Kentucky my sophomore year of college. But the funny thing is, is I moved to Nashville the day after the Tyree catch was my first day in Nashville. Fun fact, I normally don't talk about myself once we get into this section of the show, but I figured you guys would appreciate it. So like everybody was like, hey, nice to meet you. Where are you from? And I'm like, Boston. They're like, oh, cool. (laughs) Bet you really like that game last night. I was like, nope, no, I didn't. But, you know, hell of a catch. Yeah, it's all right. I uh, was a Saints fan. Moved to New Orleans, got a job with the Saints. And my very first game that I worked at was the no call. Oh, man. 
<laughs> so I'm sitting there like dream come true. I'm, you know, I'm underneath like in the, the kind of the, the, the industrial section of the Superdome. You know, we have we're, we're unpacking all the, the, the next morning's newspapers. I say the Saints are going to the Super Bowl. We have champagne. We're pulling out. No call happens. We, we watch the game slip through our hands and I'm sitting there surrounded by newspapers talking about how the Saints have won the game and are going to the Super Bowl. It was this like surreal, horrible timing movement. So what did you do for the Saints? I think that's a great question. Well, I, I'm still there. Okay. Saints and Pelicans. I do uh, sponsorship marketing, um, sp- specifically like sales and analytics. Um, so any of the sponsors on the team really trying to figure out what their ROI and measuring our success with them. Can I commiserate with you for a second because i feel sure. like people think having worked at espn all that stuff everybody thinks like oh i'm gonna get this job i'm gonna be with the saints i'm a huge saints fan it's gonna be awesome to work for the saints is it awesome or is it kind of a job at the same time it's both right yeah. you know I, I tell people like our accountants do the same accounting work as any other accountant right like you know our it does the same it it's like the, the, the job function is no different So the nine to five piece, but there is something special, you know, you go into work on a Monday after a big win or after a big loss. And like the whole office is like riding the high or is like horribly depressed. And there's, there's something really kind of special about the, the atmosphere of the place. So I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and say something that I've said, pull back the curtain too many times. So like if you're at home drink, the thing we were talking about before we got in here was Devin was saying like, I've had to have all these calls with certain distilleries because Chase has a, a day job and he can't make these calls. Totally makes sense now. I don't think the Saints want him in there talking about whiskey in the middle of the day. Devin, what's your day job that allows you to sneak away? Don't say who it is because we don't want to get you fired. Well, I've worked in film and television for the last 12 years. Uh, So right now I manage travel for a very popular HBO television show. Succession. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sweet. I was thinking like John Oliver, but that works too. I'm kidding. That was a, a um, yeah. joke. They're not traveling much. <laughs> I don't think so. But no, it's it's uh, it's good. But you know, I'm I've been trying to sort of transfer full time more into whiskey for years now, and it's actually part of what sort of you know would lit the spark for creating American Mash and Grain in the first place. You know, for the the part of the website where you are featuring distilleries and kind of showcasing the craft distillery it does help to have some film and television background in order to do that. So let's start, like, how do y'all meet each other? I know, did you meet each other in Jersey? Is this like a lifelong friendship thing? And then what got you both into whiskey? We met each other, pushing each other in line uh, to go to recess at kindergarten. Oh, wow. Uh, This is like deep. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, it was my second day at the school. Chase had been there for a half year already. So uh, he felt like he had some sort of seniority over me, I guess, uh, in terms of where we were in line. Who knows who who shoved who first, but it ended up with both of us parked on a bench. So at our school, when you got in trouble as a kid, you got benched. That's what they called it, which is you had to sit on a bench that faced the playground so you could watch all the kids play and have fun while you sat there next to the teachers. And, uh, you know, we you know we commiserated over not being able to play. We found out we both loved the Power Rangers and <laughs> you know, and apple juice at snack. And uh, you know, it's been a it's been a wonderful friendship ever since. So yeah, we've been uh, friends for a long time. I have to ask. I mean, Chase, how did you growing up in Jersey? How were you a Saints fan? It's a good question. You know, my family's uh, from Beaumont, Texas, so just over the Texas border, off of I ten. They were all Oilers fans, and when the Oilers left to go be be the Titans, so you know, close to you guys, there was a big family vote at my my grandparents' house where they more or less said, "Screw the Cowboys," you know, the Saints are the next closest team, and you know, that's how how we, we migrated. And then that's really not how you team. treat America's team, right there. That is really <laughs> not how. That's fine. That's just fine. There was a weatherman that was saying like, uh, what's the troll? Do you remember the troll that just like happened? It was like something about how it hasn't been good since the nineties. And it was referring to the temperatures, but it was also referring to the Cowboys. It was like, the weather's not very good this week, but the Cowboys haven't been good since the nineties. So, you know, it was just like a, out of nowhere, just gut punch to the Cowboys, which I was, I'm here for it. But, uh, you know, not anything to any Cowboys fans, but 
Got to rep the the Giants Cowboys rivalry. I really did want the Bills to just get one of those. You know, like I was a big Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, Don Beebe fan. You know, obviously being a Patriots fan, but like the first Super Bowls, I actually remember getting to stay up for were those Cowboys Bills Super Bowls, and you're just like, let them win one. You have to think that 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 disappointment and the desperation is really what has formed Bills Mafia as we know it today. Like. That is just a, a national treasure, right? Do we like, would we like looking back as a non Bills fan, like, yeah, let them lose if we get Bills Mafia today? So, one of my favorite things used to be the Preakness. So, like, just everything about the Preakness when I was covering horse racing and the running of the porta potties. So, they they run across the top of the porta potties at Pimlico. And I mean, people take full beers and this is like eight o'clock in the morning all the way till the afternoon and people run across the top and they get pelted. I mean, they don't let them do it anymore, but you would get pelted with a full beer and somebody, you just watch them fall on their ass. And like Bill's mafia, when they come into Nashville, they literally set up tables, go to the top of a staircase jump off the staircase to break the table just to break the table like i don't understand it but it's so awesome at the same time not only that like everyone it's gotten to the point where they've normalized it right like when they come to town the fan base comes like the the security of the stadium knows what to happen and like they just they totally change how they regulate tailgating around the stadium just to allow for bill's mafia to be itself it's great i love how this has deviated so far just from the fact that you two pushed each other in line. It's gone from pushing in line at kindergarten to Bill's Mafia. That's, it always ends up there. Yeah. So lifelong friends, you stayed together thick and thin. And then one of you had to have gotten into whiskey first. Like one of you pulled the other one into it. So who was it? It was me. I've and that's Devin for more. those of you that can't recognize the voices yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been more of a whiskey drinker, you know, even when we were, you know, not at a appropriate age to be drinking, I was sooner to, you know, I, I always tell people, I, I was sooner to have a little bit of maker's Mark or Jack Daniels in my solo cup than drink, uh, the Natty ice or Milwaukee beast, you know, which was sort of Chase's go-to. And then you know, somewhat sometime around 2017, my wife and I went to Ireland for a vacation uh, we stumbled into the Irish Whiskey Museum by accident. We were going to go see Trinity College, kind of got there early. There was a tour at the museum across the street, and I just kind of got bit by the – I was so fascinated by the history and how it's made and the process and spent the rest of that vacation drinking as much Irish whiskey as I could get my hands on. And then when I got back to the States, was just like, all right, I feel like I kind of get the history of Irish whiskey, but – What's bourbon? You know, what's rye? What what are these single malts and scotch? You know, what's uh, so I kind of just fell down the you know rabbit hole and started working for a few different craft distilleries in sort of like part time roles. And then the pandemic rolled around and, and everything kind of shut down. So I was like, well, what do I do now? This is kind of the direction I want to be going in. But, you know, we're all sitting at home. So what now? And that's how. American Mash and Grain started. So when you originally started, this was not your goal to have a whiskey or was it? No, I mean, for me, I just wanted to be a part of it. You know, I went to film school to become a filmmaker to, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a director, just like every other knob that goes to film school, basically. But, you know, I, I got out, I got into the industry. I started working right away, but I was working in more of the like logistical aspect of it, more behind the scenes in terms of like, running a production office or, you know, writing cast contracts. There's a lot of spreadsheets and emails and, but I was working 60 to 80 hours a week and just thinking to myself, I feel real like adjacent to my creative dreams, but I'm not fulfilling them. And so know, it's like with, Chase working with the saints. You, you know, Dennis Allen calls me up every, every uh, Saturday and asks me what the, the strategy should be. So I feel pretty much in the mix on things. <laughs> Yeah, I, I found a real creative opportunity with whiskey, uh, a place to blend art and science together. And uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do in the industry, but I knew that I wanted to do something. But was kind of flailing around until Chase, Chase is the one that sort of came up with the with the initial idea. So what made you think of it then, Chase? Because I feel like this sounds very similar to dads drinking bourbon with the exception of like, Zeke and I weren't friends since kindergarten. And then when we had the idea to go ahead and start a blog at first, 
Zeke didn't write anything. So just like now, it's one person driving it. So that was you, Chase. You were the one who was originally, and then like roles flip flopped because of your work. Devin's certainly the heartbeat and the drive, right? Devin did all of our early writing. I, I certainly did not. I know what my, my limitations and my skills are. But for me, it was, um, you know, we were early COVID or it was you were just getting going and I was stuck at home and really just looking for a way to reconnect with Devin and all my friends and take on new hobbies and, and, and just kind of like fill the time. Um, you know, and at the same time, Devin had this, you know, he was trying to figure out how to, how to kind of move forward his ambition in the whiskey industry as things were shutting down. It's like, okay, well, may, maybe we can accomplish both these tasks. And, and so I was like, we, we talked to craft distilleries, we, we do some storytelling, we interview like he and I can spend a lot of time together and, you know, the, you get the ancillary benefit that maybe sometimes we get some samples and I'll get some free whiskey out of the whole thing. So like uh, for me, it really, it really was born out of kind of an ambition to help create a path for him to, to pursue his, his passion. And, and for me to, to have a reason to, to reconnect with, with some friends and to drink and to drink. Yeah. Well, that's, I don't know how you connect with friends, but that's pretty <laughs> fundamental for me. <laughs> I mean, that's very important. That's why I am drinking a pour with y- y'all right now. That's very, very important. I think you find very quickly, though, the the blog side of it. It's great. It's fun. People, I don't know, even when it comes to a podcast, I mean, this is something I think about all the time, is that we try to make an entertaining podcast and we'll do some banter in the beginning, but then when it comes down to the actual review, it's like for most people that listen to the show, it's like, okay, if you want the banter, the banter's there. If not, skip about 10 minutes in. You're going to get everything you need. But we feel like we're not giving you enough if we just come in and give a two to five minute show and say, this is what we think about the whiskey. Like, I feel... Like with sponsors and all that other stuff, it's like we have to give you a show. Half the people just want you to come on and say, hey, I get this on the taste, this on the the nose, this on the the finish, and I would get it or I wouldn't. And same thing with a blog. They want you to go. I I know this is a long setup for a question, but... You know, same thing with a the blog. They they want you to just get to say, I'm looking at your website out of Frey Ranch, like really like the cast strength. Uh, the, the other one's okay, but it's not as good as the cast strength. Okay, with Black Button, I got this. With Virginia, I got this. Like they just want the, the two second version of things. So how do you find that balance, at least on the website with what you're doing, that gives them the information they want, but it's not too much information that you start getting trolled? We, we joke that like in a world where like everyone's attention pan is in a world. Attention. Sorry. I, in a world. <laughs> Whenever anybody says in, in a world, have you ever seen that movie? In a world. In a world. There's actually, so Devin and I, when we were in high school, made, made a, a movie our senior year. There is a trailer of it on YouTube and like the opening bits, the trailer is like, in a world, you know, it was like literally the opening line, the, 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 the voiceover for the trailer. So we get it. In a world where blog posts were too long. Everyone's attention span is getting so short. And so Devin and I had the brilliant idea of like, well, let's write really long articles because <laughs> like that is like not like what any sort of good market research kind of consumer insights tells you to do. But like we're going to go do that. So like I don't know if we have struck the balance, but for the kind of story we wanted to tell and for the kind of story, I think these, you know, these entrepreneurs, these craft producers, the, these people who are literally pouring, like taking a big risk to to start something that they just deserve a little bit more than a soundbite. And so like, I think it, it's for us, is we want to make sure we're, we're respecting that and we're, we're kind of, you know, telling the, the, the appropriate story, not so much concerned with the balance or, or the sound bites or the tasting notes for, for what people actually want. And I get that a hundred percent and I want to get to what you all do, but I think for us too, it's like when we give a review, it's one thing to say you don't like it, but why? And if you're not spending that extra time saying why you're doing a disservice to the distillery because they don't understand like, okay, what's your palate? What do you think? And and it's completely okay to not like something, but it's not okay to be like, hey, I don't like it, but I'm not going to give you feedback as to what I think about it. What I like about what you do, and if, if you look at this, it's mashandgrain.com. So it's mash, 
the letter N, and then green.com, you tell the whole story. So it would be like if I had somebody on for an hour and asked them their story to tell me their story, tell me about everything, that is the amount of stuff that you have in there. If I were to start at the top of Frey Ranch, I mean, it is a good 13 wheels on my mouse before I get down to where the tasting notes are. Like, that's a lot. Now, you have finally figured out not to make you two have to be the one to write these, because I see yeah. there's somebody else on this uh, website. This is a woman named Megan who wrote this one. But you really do a good, I mean, you want people, I would think that you are catering this to the 1% of the whiskey community that really wants to get in there and understand everything about a distillery rather than just hey tell me the stats on this bottle i'm about to drink yeah i mean a couple of things went into the thought process early on the first one was focusing exclusively on craft right so we we tell long form holistic stories about craft whiskey distilleries because we feel like with the evolving american craft whiskey movement that's been happening over the last 10 20 30 years wherever you kind of want to put your your pin to start it uh you know the concept of what american whiskey is is really changing for so long it has been bourbon and bourbon is incredible but bourbon's story, we feel like, has been told, is being told. What's happening on the on the periphery, what's happening around the country, and how that could maybe impact American whiskey long term was something that, that really interested us. And with my sort of more, I would say, 1% nerdy, you know, sort of obsession with the sort of process and philosophy behind making the product and Chase's uh, expertise and understanding of branding and marketing and how are you telling that story of who you are out there, that was sort of where the, the concept of like, well, we could really tell, we could do a good job between the two of us covering a lot of the bases. And, you know, early on, I said, you know, my dream for the website would be that eventually we get to a point where we're big enough and well known enough that it's like, do you, you want to know what Frey Ranch is about. You want to know what Far North is about. You want to know what Catoctin Creek is about. Like, go to American Mash and Grain. That's going to be a really great, you know, big story picture. And when we were starting out, we were looking on the on the internet to try to get an idea for what the website could be. And we saw that ninety five percent of it is just tasting notes. And if they wrote anything about the distillery at all, or you know, maybe it was a couple sentences or a paragraph or two at most, and nobody was really telling the the who, the why, and the where of what these whiskeys were. And so we have the tasting notes on there too, but we feel like it tells a more complete story when those tasting notes are in context to everything that you read before it. So that you're not just coming in and saying, oh, vanilla on the nose, but actually like, well, maybe why? Maybe why? How did they, how are they trying to get to what we're tasting or nosing in this spirit? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll piggyback on that, right? Like tasting notes really are the epitome of, of judging something by the, the destination and not the journey. Right. And, and, and I, I really think craft whiskey, which has such a mountain decline in terms of establishing itself in, in, in the, you know, whether in the shadow or in the wake of, of, of Kentucky and Tennessee bourbons, which are so good and so well established, like, that is a really hard thing for for small independent craft producers to overcome. And if people want to want to turn their nose up and say, "Oh, like this craft product isn't as good as this," you know, six year old, eight year old, you know, uh, Kentucky product, like, well, well, no. But there's a lot of experimentation, or they're they're coming back, create, you know, they have a creative solution things, or like they're totally trying to define a whole new regional expression of something. Like you're going to lose all of that context. And I think to not appreciate and not highlight the journey more so than the destination would, would actually stifle a lot of that creativity a lot. Like really to the detriment of the, the long-term, like how good can American whiskey be? To give you both some like unsolicited feedback though, I think this could turn into the craft Wikipedia for American distilleries. If you think about it, like, and it's almost like as I was reading it and you know, that little box that pops up on Wikipedia that gives you like the short info 
on stuff like if i were to look up nashville tennessee the first thing it says it's like here's the flag here's the seal here's the county here's the state here's the country and when it was founded who's the mayor what's the population stuff like that i almost wish like on the side it says like okay catoctin creek like here's when it was founded here's where it's located and then like here's the barrel that like the types of barrels they use they use a kelp i mean this isn't true i'm not i'm throwing this out but like they use a char number three kelvin like whatever it is like have that it doesn't have to have their proof for everything because things are you know but it's like what are the cooperages because like from my point of view from a, a podcaster that's in here it's like i'm trying to find information quickly there is no quick information about any distilleries that are out there i still want to read the article because if i'm doing my due diligence and i'm trying to figure out like okay i'm going to interview you know fray ranch i want to know what's going on with fray ranch like i'm going to go to mashandgrain.com and figure that out by reading it but i also like might be in the middle of a podcast with zeke and i'm like man what the hell char do they use like over at fray ranch again like i forget and then if there's a place to go that's you know you know you can go to breaking bourbon but then you're digging through articles to see if they even mentioned stuff like that i actually think that's an incredible idea <laughs> by the way so thank you for that uh for that tidbit because i think something with a sort of quick hit like that would be i think it, i think that's and i also appreciate you mentioning the barrels because Ch chase always gives me shit when we're prepping for an interview with like the number of questions i have about the barrels <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a long running joke with us i'm telling you people that are sourcing from places like mgp now i mean like i just did a pick on friday at nashville barrel company and like as they're presenting the barrels after you blind taste and figure out which one you want it's like okay barrel number two was independent stave like barrel number three was kelvin barrel number like it, it is absolutely you know, are they going to space side are they going to isc are they going to great american barrel company like these are things people want to know because there's different chars that are put on the barrels depending on where it's going and also just finding that sweet oak i mean at least for me i'm looking for the sweet oak all the time listen i i, I appreciate it i think the quick hit is, is a great idea for every time we have those interviews it's it, there's new questions to them if not her sassy i've heard that Devin asked this same barrel questions like we copy and paste it for every interview prep that's more for the humorous gum not that i don't appreciate where the, where the barrel choices are i mean he is a logistical guy that's what you two bring you each have your strength and of course the logistical guy is going to ask the logistic i i work at operations too i get it i'm sure Devin has the, the same like i asked the same handful of questions or like some variation of like i i have some go-tos as well as to why the name like what's the story behind all that and you know the, the tagline on those pieces um so we each have our, our area where we kind of go deep on it. With you two, is one person leading it off and then the other person comes in like 15 minutes in and asks a question or? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how all the great I usually, duos work? <laughs> I, I usually, uh, I mean, I usually lead off with the like, you know, with all the sort of intro questions, the history questions. And, and then we sort of, I don't know, after that, it, we kind of have to feel it out. I feel like our kind of typical you know, move is I start history. He comes in with brand. I finish with production. But, you know, every once in a while you get one of these distillers. Distillers can be somewhat long winded. We've learned over the last uh, several years. Sometimes it's just about like, all right, well, this guy just talked about 15 different topics. Like, which one should we should we go with next? So, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, fortunately, most people that we talk to have to listen to me talk for at least 15 minutes before they get to hear Chase's very inspiring brand related questions. But it's one of two things. Either the distillers want to talk for a long time or they don't want to talk at all. They're like, just leave me alone. Let me make whiskey. Go talk to the marketing people. But Chase, what is it about the brand that you're looking for and and are you asking these questions now for the website or are you asking them more for like who you want to work with well i mean kind of by the time we ask them the questions we're, we're already kind of working with them on the website in, in the borrowed page piece right it's um we do select based off who we think is a good fit but on a product and both on a product and a storytelling platform but that's not like none of this is like we've never really gone into it like trying to evaluate whether or not they should go into Bard page. For me, the storytelling, the, the brand components is more like you have such limited real estate to communicate effectively who you are, why you do what you do, 
and and maybe something interesting about the product itself. And so like when brands are trying to kind of develop those pieces about themselves, you have to be really intentional with how you, you use that real estate. And I think it can be quite telling about what their priorities are and why they got into the business. Yeah, why did why did they leave their high paying job to go spend their life savings, uh, you know, and, and, and buy a small still and, and, and build a, you know fill a bunch of five gallon barrels? Like like what what's the motivation? And so like I actually think the small things that people maybe don't invest too much energy into is you know the name the the tagline the what does the logo look like what is the why was the bottle you know shape chosen the way it was actually like in instances can really um illuminate a lot of the behind the scenes thinking and motivations for people in a way that like when you talk to them about the whiskey, like they want to geek out, they want to like, you can go so deep on, on the barrels and the production, the mash bill and things like that, but you lose a little bit of that purpose. And I think the marketing elements really can be a good window into that. I will say, you know, like any brand, like every once in a while we, we run into a dead, a dead end. We're like, Oh, we brought a marketing agency in, you know, they, they, they recommended these things or like, it's my last name is the name of the whiskey. Like there, there are like, we, 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 do, we do get like some very, abrupt non-interesting answers and like we kind of sw- we strike out but in the instances where we landed i think we landed big on the marketing side well there's a whole thing too with the craft side versus the big players and the, the big players are like ah, oh, well this is what the brand team told me to do right and then the craft side i think some of them are still figuring things out like and i still famously we've talked about this all the time this is a bourbon so i know you're not gonna you don't care about them as much but you know my friends over at penelope bourbon the first time i had a conversation with mike you're putting out 80 proof whiskey named penelope like and no penelope's my daughter and i'm like i had no idea like you're not talking about that enough and you need to start talking about that more so i almost feel like the stories behind it like people like yourselves that are actually asking them those questions i I don't know if they've ever had somebody ask them the question to kind of look at their marketing and say like, Hey, are we doing this? Okay. Like, are they paying you consulting money? For this because they need to be i mean in the sense that you're basically giving their company a review from the top to bottom with the expertise you have in the different areas it's almost like you're consulting i keep waiting for the day like i i, I give like you a lot of unsolicited advice as well <laughs> to, to some of these distillers. like you know what you really should do is change x y and z or lean into this i keep waiting for the day that like we see distillery change their label their logo or their, their tagline or something in the wake of our conversation it has yet to happen but if that happens you know maybe we slide them an american mash and grain bill or something after the fact you know you are pushing them to defend their position like you chose your last name for this why or it just so happens to be our last name and we own the ranch like it worked out or like that's the name of the creek that's down the street and that's where we're getting our water there are certain things that are kind of no-brainers i think you're right but even like like frey ranch right like when we talked about the description of just using his name as the as the the name like the the, the ranch obviously is his last name and then then the ranch so the distillery became Frey Ranch like he talks about like oh it's just we're farmers that's what we do we're not creative people and I, I can't remember all the farm equipment he starts rattling off that are like they're just named for what they do and so like it was kind of in its simplicity like oh like it seems like a, a, a dumb response but like it was actually very telling and very in line with his kind of like heritage as a farmer and I think that like the small things can actually be quite telling as well. No knock on Frey Ranch, by the way, either, because their branding is oh. actually like beautiful. Like everything, every element that they put onto that bottle is is great. I lean more towards logistics and the branding, and Zeke's more like just, hey, does it taste good or not? <laughs> when it comes to the the branding, I really think like how much if this is something I did, if I put something together and was going to put my name on it, it's something that's mine. Like I understand there are cost factors, but what am I thinking is worthy of the product that I'm putting out into the world? But no, you look at Frey Ranch, like the bottle is heavy. It is a heavy bottle. They take a lot of detail, even to the cork and what is, is going on. That Like everything about that says, this is my brand. I give a shit about what you all think about my brand. And I want the bottle to be good. I want the whiskey to be good, period. Just because it's well thought out doesn't mean it has to be complicated. Yeah. Like, and, and I think Frey Ranch is the, the embodiment of that, right? Like 
it was, they had a clear and simple answer. They didn't need to over-engineer what it was going to be called, but they gave a lot of depth to how it's represented. You know, the, it's the details. It's, it's the, the bolt on, on the cap because, you know, when they do all the mechanics for their, their equipment, they're always moving, you know, taking the bolts in and out. It's the, the label itself that resembles the belt buckle. So the shape of that is kind of kind of in that this this farmer motif, like you know, it's the the color of the corn is what they selected. Like there, there's a lot of intentionality, and I think simple and intentional is the farmer style, right? Like like there was there was never going to be a manifestation of Frey Ranch other than that. And I think craft distillers across the board, pretty much, um, they're they're craftspeople, right? Like they they take a lot of pride in what they do. And even if they don't necessarily have all the resources and skills to make the branding and the bottle and the label perfect in their first effort, there is a, an iterative process and they're developing it over time. And same with the the, the spirit itself. And I think that's what's so, been so compelling for us on, on the craft front and telling the holistic storytelling from like, what is your history? Why is your brand the way it is? Why is your product the way it is? And why it's important for us to tell, you know, probably too long of, of stories than we, we should because of the consumer attention span, because like a lot of that is going to be the groundwork for, for current and in future amazing whiskey. That's good. Then, you know, change the, the conversation about what American whiskey is. And I love that you have these other distilleries on here as well, not to change the topic, but like, I just don't <laughs> want it to think that it's all centered on Frey ranch. Cause that was the first one I saw and now it's in my head, but like, <laughs> you know, you have Toluna and Charvet and old Dominic and mammoth and Virginia distillery company. And I'm actually talking to Virginia later on this week, but you know, stolen wolf, Bainbridge watershed, which watershed has some great stuff up in Columbus. The only to name a few, I mean, spirits of French Lake laws, few far North high wire, Catoctin Creek, Hamilton. There's so many good ones on here. I mean, I almost wonder, is part of this too to maybe focus on the people? You know, we talk about it a lot, about like, can we like increase our, our like the amount of content we put out? Because the people piece is big. And, you know, when you when you start looking at, you expand, you know, open the aperture a little bit, right? Not just the people who are, who are hands-on, mashing, malting, you know, distilling, bottling, all those pieces, but like the, the supporting cast around it is so big. Like, what about all the, the small local farmers, right that need to exist across the country you, know, you one of the stories i would love to tell if we ever got more people or more time or, or, or whatever is you know, there's, a, there's a woman allison bad that we, we learned about through our um mammoth distilling conversation she's up there you know in, you know, found all the peat bogs in, in in northern michigan and is allowing them to, to kind of like use that harvested peat and so she's got this malting house in northern michigan like that's a really interesting like what circumstances creates a person like that and that's like super compelling and yet she's not in the distillery she's not making the bash well but she's a certainly an integral part to their process and i think the human element is like a huge open frontier for us to kind of wade into you know we have an industry section on our website it's relatively small we've spoken to robin robinson uh we spoke to clay risen from the new york times but yeah i mean we we have an aspiration to have a, a whole other section of the website that's dedicated more to that to that side of things that I think it's something as sort of Chase alluded to is American Mash and Grain is still a super small operation. Uh, we have a lot of hopes for what we could grow into being. Even you know six years into this, I understand that as well. The beautiful thing about our company is we have pay equity. Everybody makes the same thing, which is at $0, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> everybody's got that, uh, the points, you know, you're, you're just getting more and more points every single time you do some work, but yeah, <laughs> I love the website though. And I know we talked for a long time about this website, but go to mashandgrain.com. It is a great place to find out some more about craft distilleries. And as you're able to reach out to more of these distilleries, and more want to work with you i think we'll just see the the amount of knowledge that's on this page increase astronomically before we go we have to talk about borrowed borrowed page i'm saying that very canadian mm. hey we have to talk about borrowed, borrowed page um, oh don't you know oh uh it's over by the tim hortons i i went and got some donuts and i got some borrowed page whiskey but this borrowed page American whiskey, that's more American. Thank you, John. It's really cool because it is four different distilleries. And over at Watershed, I think kind of put a bug in your head. She's awesome. Tell me the story of how this whiskey for American Mash and Grain, because it's very unique. It's four different distilleries that you've blended together. How did all this happen? The idea of possibly producing a whiskey 
in some way, shape or form was discussed early on between Chase and I, we, we, you know, sort of thinking about, all right, we'll start, we have the website and that'll be great. But also like, if it becomes popular, how could we grow, you know, how could we grow? How could we keep doing what we're doing, but in different ways? And I think we knew that we were going to be sourcing whiskey, most likely to, to put a product out early on. And, you know, sourcing whiskey is not a novel concept uh, around the world, especially not here in America. But one thing that we definitely wanted to make sure differentiated us was transparency in talking with a lot of people. It's not that the, it's not that a lot of people have a problem with sourced whiskey. They have a problem with not necessarily knowing where that's coming from or feeling like the brand is being disingenuous with the way that it presents itself. So we knew that we wanted to lean into hyper-transparency. We knew we wanted to partner with craft whiskey distilleries that we had featured on the website so that we were working with people we had already established a relationship with. But outside of that, we hadn't thought too much more about it until we launched the website. And the website was just kind of going. And I think at some point, probably around the time when it became more evident that the that American single malt was going to become standardized by the TTB, which you know I think we're we're in some sort of like sixty to eighty day note period or whatever whatever we are with that. It's um, very close. I mean, they've defined the category now, so they've said this is our yeah. preliminary. This is what it's going to be, and speak yeah, now or forever standard. hold your peace. I'm, and I'm super excited. Right. What the American Single Malt Commission has done is incredible. You know, American Single Malt becoming a standardized whiskey is is huge for American whiskey. It's huge for the producers who make American Single Malt. It's a you know, it's a really cool time to be into craft whiskey and into American whiskey because this is happening. But I may or may not have some opinions on those standards and and wish that maybe they were slightly different. And started to think, you know, with American Single Malt on the precipice of being standardized. American whiskey as this sort of very vague catch-all term might kind of be like the last real bastion of true unbridled innovation and experimentation in American whiskey where, well, we could be blending multiple styles of whiskey together. Like we don't have to put out a bourbon. We don't have to put out rye. We don't have to put out a single malt. We could blend multiple styles of whiskey together from all these different craft distilleries and make an American whiskey and you know, I kind of had this idea of what if we could make something that's, you know, the, it's the it's it's great on its it's great altogether. It's an incredible whiskey on its own, but also is able to use some of those sort of more distinctive aspects of the individual whiskeys that were made to, you know, put it together as a way to help put the focus back on the people that made it. And I thought, well, that's a kind of, you know, sourced product that I haven't really seen out there before. And it felt like it kind of was within our ethos of who we are trying to sort of help with the, you know, expand the profile of the American craft whiskey movement, shine a light on these small independent producers, and at the same time, make something that was cool and new and different and, and help challenge the conversation about what American whiskey could be. That's sort of where the idea came from. Piggyback on that, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Devin, it's like, um, we have a mission, right, to help elevate the, the, you know, the profile of, of craft whiskey in the country, right? The, people are so fixated on, on American whiskey is bourbon, right? Like, the, the, it's not, not, true bourbon is great and it is you know certainly the pioneer in american whiskey but like um, well, not even that american whiskey is bourbon but that american whiskey is kentucky bourbon yeah. we set on this mission really to, to be the, the long format storytellers and i, I we're so proud of the, the su success we've had and you know the stories we, we've told but there is still a limit right like some of these small independent craft producers across the country like their hometowns know who they are the country doesn't know who they are. The, the international, the, the global whiskey community certainly doesn't know who they are. And, and so every story we tell, every there is a natural kind of um, border to, to how far it can reach. And so we kind of wanted this product to be a manifestation of that goal, right? Elevating the profile. It's, we liken it to like um, when TV shows do crossovers, right? The fan base of one TV show gets exposed to the fan base to the other TV show and vice versa. And all of a sudden you, you expand who your, your, your fan base could be and you expand the number of people who know who those distilleries are. And what we really liked about the concept and in, in, in intentionally blending these four distilleries and, and putting their labels right on the front of it is like people who are in Columbus, Ohio and who are fans of Watershed Distillery might learn for the first time who Whiskey Dell back is. Is, right, they they might go pick up a bottle of, of Lee Sinclair Spirits of French Lick the next time they're at the liquor store, right? And and so we by cross pollinating these distilleries and, and, and kind of trying to create a, a wholly new expression, something that's like as weird and innovative and, and creative as, as craft whiskey can and should be, and this American whiskey expression, like 
what we've done is we, we've created a platform for all these distilleries and in ourselves included to, to try and tell a different story of what, what American whiskey can be. I mean, John, you, you have to admit, like, if we didn't create this, you wouldn't be having a conversation with us. We wouldn't have talked about Delback or Wiggle or, or, or Watershed or any of these distilleries with you, um, though you might have spoken to previously. So like, there is a lot of value in creating a product, right, to try and help create some momentum behind this mission. I 100% think we would have talk to each other eventually because you have a cool website and we we could have talked in that your know, regard but you're right i mean i think the closest thing we have to some stuff and even just shouting out to another podcast like you know you have pursuit series that is taking whiskey from multiple distilleries and putting it together a little bit of what barrels doing but i would say pursuit is probably the closest to american mash and grain but they're not necessarily taking an american single malt from new mexico and putting it is it New Mexico where it is? In- Arizona. Uh, Tucson, Arizona. Oh, sorry. Close, close, but no cigar. But it is a, a peaty, smoky uh, American single malt that you're putting with a rye and you're putting with two bourbons. And you put all that together, and that is what your first borrowed page is. Sorry, borrowed page. But it is 34% watershed bourbon. It is 32% wiggle. Mongolo. Monongahela. Uh, rye. 24% spirits of French lick. This is the Lee Sinclair bourbon. And then 10% whiskey Delbach mesquite smoked single malt. I mean, it is very unique. Nobody else is doing this right now, at least from what I've seen, is putting together this stuff. And it, it's a tough combination because I will tell you the nose on this to the front of the palate like this is two different pours in one pour the nose is so sweet and you get a lot of that vanilla and and, and all that other stuff there and then about mid palate that whiskey delback takes over and it's like all right this is my show now and you get that smokiness and you get that like it's almost like the your throat right there gets that little singe in it like uh you're you're really getting that smoky uh it's like all right now now the fire is coming out and you only put 10 percent in there but i have to imagine as you were playing with that blend you can't put more than 10 percent in there it's good on its own but like it takes over the pour right it's 10 percent, and even the 10 percent is is blended right so that's not it's not a hundred percent smoked, you know, grain going into that ten percent. So it's really about five percent smoked, smoked grain in that that blend, and that's just how strong it is. Like it, it is very, very like the smoke is just one of those things, and and it grows right when we first blend it. It's a little bit more mellow, and then after we let it sit for a little bit, it kind of grew over the weekend for the retesting. So it's it's a it's a very difficult thing to try and work into the mash or into the the blend profile. Anybody who's done an infinity bottle, you put a malt in that infinity bottle, it takes over. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, this is a little bit more of a malted bourbon, and I'm going to put that in the bottle. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my whole bottle tastes like malt. I think about what you all are doing with this, and that's like the same thing. It's how do you blend together four completely different types of whiskeys in a way that makes sense? So how do you even begin to go about like what you were doing where and how did you get these distilleries to be okay with like all right there's going to be more of this one and less of you i hope you don't get bummed out about that well i'll start with kind of like how how we came to these four distilleries in this blend it kind of started by chance so i was working at king county distillery uh at the time i worked there for the last couple years in a variety of different roles but I was leading a tasting class one night and and somebody from the distillery told me that Greg Lehman from Watershed Distillery was going to be there. And we had just featured Watershed not that long before. So I already had sort of established a little bit of a rapport with him. So I offered to give him a private tour after the tasting, you know, and we're touring the distillery and he just asked me, you know, how, uh, how's American Mash and Grain going? What are you guys, you know, working on? And I don't know where I found the like, courage or the gall or whatever you want to call it to just like throw this concept out at him when we like, you know, Chase and I hadn't even talked about approaching any distilleries about this. Uh, but I mentioned, you know, what we were kind of kicking around with this concept of a blended American whiskey with craft distilleries. And, you know, Greg Lehman is like the sweetest guy ever, super humble and, and nice. And, you know, he was like, well, you know, if you guys would ever 
possibly you know consider us to be a part of it like you know we would you know we would definitely be interested and you know inside my heart is racing and like that that's how sort of watershed came on board and and actually greg and, and ann who you mentioned who was at watershed at the time were super helpful they hopped on a call with chase and i just to sort of talk about like okay like how could we actually make this a reality they spent like an hour or two hours with us just talking through the logistics, the legality, the licenses, the cost of what, you know, to try to give us a, you know, a, a wide lens of, of what this journey might look like. Um, and we left the call feeling super encouraged. I mean, it was a daunting, but we were like, yeah, we can make this happen. So, uh, you know, the way that the rest of them came together is we love Alan Bishop at Spirits of French Lick, just a super cool guy, an incredible distiller. We just had a feeling like if anybody was going to be on board with this kind of idea, it would be somebody like Alan. And, and we were thankful enough that he was super enthusiastic, like off the gate. And he was like, he's like, I don't know why we wouldn't do this. Uh, let me talk to the Doties, you know, like, let me get, you know, figure this out. And that was great. Um, my first ever job in the whiskey industry was as a New York City brand ambassador for Wiggle, going into restaurants and bars and liquor stores, tasting their products. So, you know, and they've got a really cool product that's got a lot of cool history behind it. It's a really unique rye. So I reached out to Meredith and Alex uh, Grelly, and they were super enthusiastic. And, and when we were trying to kind of find the final piece of it, trying to do a proof of concept, right, of, of bringing these, of having the distinctive elements sort of point back to the place where they were made, I couldn't think of a more distinct element than the mesquite smoked single malt from Whiskey Dalback. So we went to Steve and Paul and his team. And I think the thing that's kind of crazy is like, we've heard a lot of distilleries talk about the, all of these kind of journeys of like, if you knew what it would entail at the beginning, like maybe you wouldn't do it. And I, I kind of understand where those people are coming from. But what kind of kept the fire lit was every single person that we talked about, whether it was the distilleries or like the glass vendors or the toppers vendors or wherever, like everybody was just super enthusiastic about the idea. They were like, this is really cool. And I don't know anybody that's doing this. So why, you know, let's be a part of it. So um, I, at the end of the day, I don't truly know why any of these distilleries decided to trust me and Chase who have absolutely zero credibility or or track record of blending anything at all we just you know it was the enthusiasm of others that kept us encouraged and determined so that's how that piece came together uh i mean chase you want to talk a little bit about what the actual blending of this was like because it was it was fun but it was a challenge yeah i mean i i think for us right it's it, it's it, it takes a village right to to belabor an old old turn of phrase. And, and I, I think that's, it's kind of appropriate for, for the nature of how craft distilleries come up. You know, we've been a bit of a microcosm in that front. And so, you know, Devin and I, we, we, we struck out and we were like, all right, now we have consensus. We have people who are willing to send us whiskey provided we can find the money to buy barrels and, and, and things like that, which was a separate endeavor that we had to go through. And um, but we're like, we definitely, we, we need a guide. We need, we need someone who's going to kind of come validate the process a little bit f- for us. And that, that became endemic. What we started out, we all had similar samples of all the barrels that, that were sent to us. And again, it's COVID times, right? So like no one's engaging with the other. We, we, we all have, have virtual environments. We're, we're trying to figure out like not only trying to blend, but like blend virtually. And, and, and it, you know, it, it, it was a, a logistically a pretty crazy circumstance and really just started out with, we all evaluated the, the, all the, the barrel samples we got and we came to the first call with just with thoughts and notes and, and, and kind of rankings of what we liked. And over a series of calls, we, we, Started with if we were to do a perfect blend of Chase's favorite, separate from Devin's favorite, separate from Ann's favorite, what would that be? And what I realized is like if I just chose all of my favorite barrel selections, there's no balance to it. It's all super heavy handed. And so, like, you know, having kind of a, a, a somewhat diverse set of palettes to come in and try and find some compromise really pushed us to, to understand all right, even if, if on its own a barrel selection isn't our favorite, like maybe it helps highlight some things. You know, maybe the the wiggle, right? A, a slightly spicier or pepperier kind of rye helps balance out a, a, an overly sweet bourbon, for example. Or like you, you appreciate the oats and the creaminess in the mouthfeel. You look like you're about to say something. So I'll, I'll I am. I have a lot of questions. 
what was the yield that you ended up getting on this? Was this one barrel from each that you kind of put together? So then when it came to your samples, I know I'm like loading you with 18 questions in one. When it came to your samples, did you have one more than one version of the watershed, more than one version of the wiggle, more than one version of, you know, so you, you could go through and kind of say like, all right, I'm taking this barrel with this barrel with this barrel and then together the yield is going to pretty much equal a single barrel. So we had um, a full format barrel from um, three out of the four distilleries. Um, Whiskey Dell back was not a full, wasn't a full 53, but again, it was smoked. So like we didn't need a full 53. That would have been way too much smoke. I, I want to say the number of samples we got sent from the distilleries were somewhere between three and five might've been the most. So there were a lot of combinations that you could have put together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Absolutely. <laughs> So that makes more sense when Chase was talking about, like, if I picked my favorite single barrel of all of this and put it together, like, that's what I was trying to figure out. It's like, okay, you picked your favorite, you put it all together. That one was, eh. So how had you balance out the other ones? So how long did this process take? The blend itself. So not even getting into the proofing thing element, right? Took us a week, week and a half, right? We, we did the initial pass. Like, well, first, we started in isolation. We got our tasting notes. We came together. We did some some blends in, in real time. We talked about some stuff. And then we we chose our favorite among that. We let it sit for a few days. We came back, did a follow-up. And we, we tweaked from there. And then after we kind of had consensus on that front, we started the proofing dialogue, which was a separate endeavor. Yeah, so I mean, all in probably two weeks, but but week, week and a half of trying to get the, the barrel selections, the blend kind of nailed down. Well, I think you did a great job with it. Like I said, I mean, it's that tale of two pours. I don't think you could get other distilleries together the way that you did in this. Now, you know, obviously the one question I have to ask you, are you going to do it again with more distilleries now that you've done it this time? I and mean, you've gone through, you now have a TTB label for this, right? So this is something, or do you you have to do a new label every single time because you put the the distilleries on the front so that's going to be another tt you you kind of screwed yourselves there yeah no we did uh <laughs> but uh i think mean, you know we i think we had such you know we had such great aspirations of being able to like have the bottom label and the top label be different we were like well the top label can say the same one of those sort of passively ignorant you know we've never done this before like obviously the labels the top label the bottom label are going to get printed together uh so like we have to run them again every time but no i mean we're definitely doing it again borrowed page volume one was always you know supposed to be a first volume of of what we hope to be something that we release multiple times a year and yeah every every single time we do it it'll be different distilleries different styles of whiskey so each volume of borrowed page will be something completely different from the last um and you know we have no intention of ever replicating volume one again so you would ask sort of about the yield um which was something that you know we poured over over spreadsheets and algorithms for I don't even know how long to try to be like this is exactly where we're going to be and we weren't there but uh it's always a swag just to just to let you know it's always a swag we had one number going in you know to when we dumped the barrels we had a totally different number 24 hours out from the blend and then we wound up with a third number we weren't expecting on the on the day of the bottling so it's you know, it's not an exacting process. Well, I like when you go on a barrel pick and you just shake the barrel after and you're like, all right, this one's going to have a lot or it's not. And that's like the, <laughs> the most you go into it. But I think you were saying, Devin, before I rudely interrupted you, 720? I think somewhere around 712 ended up, you know, in the market uh, after we took out some bottles for, you know, uh, ourselves and for investors and for competition and stuff like that. So wait. Yeah, it, it initially that number has grown, right? <laughs> Since we parted ways from the actual bottle, we realized, all right, maybe that was a bit of an underestimation. You know, when you, when you start something something new, right? You, you, you're so hyper focused on the bottom line, and and we made the potentially uh, ignorant decision of going uh, at cash strength. We we ultimately decided not to proof it down at all, which would have helped our yield and would have increased that number and given us a little bit more flexibility. But we ended the day, we only took about 12 bottles out of the the bottling facility with us. And um, I think since then probably only grabbed another eight or 10 or so. So, I mean, I think we'll retail probably around 700. That's fair. I mean, I I just want to make sure y'all or get because i know what it's like you do something and then you look back and you're like i just need two bottles of it 
and then you're like, shit, I wish I still had that bottle. That would be really good. I, I did that. And then I went and bought a handful of bottles myself. My wife's like, why are you buying four additional bottles of your own whiskey? You could have just for free packed them in the suitcase when you're in Kentucky. I was like, well, we didn't think about that. We, we were like, let's not do that. And it's like everything's going back to the same place. But y'all, I can't wait to see where this goes. I think you have a very unique idea. And I'm really glad we got to talk because I feel like hopefully there are some other craft distilleries that are listening. You'll reach out to the boys at, at Mash and Grain. I think there's a, a really cool thing here too. You know, it's almost like that craft beer. There, There's a lot of partnerships and I've talked about that before on this podcast and like the stuff they're doing in Nashville Barrel Company from a bourbon point of view where you know, they're letting other distilleries kind of pour. Uh, you know, they're getting barrels from other distilleries, putting them up there. It's really cool. It's collaborative. It's showcasing a lot of love between these craft distilleries. Like I think you can have American whiskey craft distilleries play in that same vein that some of the bourbon ones are. And it's like, hey, let's just blend some really cool stuff together. You know, it's not like you're in it. It's more the love of the game, and that's what I love about it. It's, it's showcasing those distilleries, and it's getting everybody together. If distilleries realize that, like you're, you're not getting rich on this, you're finding a way to break even, get your money back, all that other stuff, You know, maybe some more people should get in on this and help these two is all I'm saying. We appreciate the Thank plug. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you're like, you said it, so we didn't have to. I, I, I never want to see a man beg on my show, <laughs> is all I'm saying. Devin, Chase, thank you so much. We're, we're going to have to have you on in the future when more of these come out, and we'll get an update on everything. And if there's ever any other ways that, that we can hook up and uh, help each other out, you know I'm here. Tell everybody where they can find you, where they can get Borrowed Page, all that other good stuff. Yeah, sure. So, I, yeah, th- I mean, first of all, thanks, John, for having us on. You son of a bitch, Chase. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not so often. We're going to get into nor- another shoving match over this. Yeah, it's, it's not often that the New Orleans internet is the, the fastest one on, on the call. Um, yeah, so, so you can follow us at, at, at mash in the letter n grain.com and, and same for, for uh, all social handles. Borrow page itself it can be purchased right through that URL. Just go to that website um, and go right there. It's pretty clear once you get there. We're really not trying to bury where to purchase the bottle. But John, mostly a big thank you. We really enjoyed the conversation and really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I did as well. And thank you both. You can find us on Facebook at Dad Drinking Bourbon, Twitter at Bourbon Dads, Instagram at Dad Drinking Bourbon. Please leave us an open and honest review, just like we leave open and honest reviews about the whiskey we drink. Hey, Zeke, where else can the folks find us? Good old Nashville, Tennessee. Cheers. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs>